A man's prayers are answered when tiny spaceship-like creatures visit their home. Faye Riley walks down a block where most buildings are getting torn down. Meanwhile, in her family's cafe, Muriel and Sid panic that Faye isn't there, though her husband Frank insists that his wife is around there. Just then, the owner finds an earth mover heading their way. Immediately, the man argues with the construction worker driving it just as his wife returns, so Muriel escorts the confused woman inside. Later, a pregnant Marisa heads to her apartment in the same building, but Carlos tries to bribe her out of her home so they can tear it down. He even teases when she finds that her boyfriend hasn't sent her a letter yet. Cornered, the woman runs to her apartment with Carlos's thug on her tail. The commotion leads to Marisa's sculpture of Mother Mary to break. Despite this, the thugs remain unapologetic and toss her the bribe money. They proceed to bother another tenant, Mason, and break through his door. However, only Mason's girlfriend is there, so she slams a painting on Carlos's hand. Next, they head to the apartment of the superintendent, whom they find hiding behind curtains. Carlos hits him with a bat, but he covers himself with a jar full of tiles that breaks. After they leave, the superintendent, Harry, steps out of his hiding place. Carlos and his thugs visit the cafe next to tempt them with the bribe money. Though everyone refuses it, the confused Faye immediately takes the money and compliments the thug, thinking he's her son. Her angry husband throws the money back at Carlos, warning him to stay away from them. Pissed, Carlos has his men throw Frank out while he wrecks their cafe. Just then, a fancy car arrives, so Frank starts yelling at the passenger, thinking that the development manager, Lacey, is inside. However, the passenger is only Lacey's assistant, Kovacs, who encourages the man to take the money and leave. Desperate, Frank later calls the cops, but the officers don't do anything, knowing that the thugs will have accomplices to testify for them. Right after the cops leave, another tenant, Mason, arrives with Mrs. Thompson, hoping that she could recommend the building for historic preservation. However, she immediately notices the building's ruined state and argues that there's nothing to preserve. Meanwhile, Frank cleans up his cafe and finds the photo of his family during the cafe's opening torn up. Mason then returns to his apartment and finds his girlfriend, Pamela, already panicking after her encounter with Carlos. She's tired of living in the place, and since the man refuses to leave or get a better job, she breaks up with him. That afternoon, Frank finds Sid and Muriel moving out after taking Carlos's bribe money. Sid assures him that they're fine as they'll be at a retirement home in New Jersey. While her husband is appalled by this, Faye thinks they're just going on vacation. That night, the discouraged man focuses on caring for his wife, who's still oblivious to what's happening. Meanwhile, Marisa gets startled upon seeing Mason throwing his paintings out the window. After tucking his wife to bed, Frank unleashes his frustrations in the kitchen. He looks at the retirement home pamphlet that Sid left, but he refuses to consider it. Instead, he prays for something to help them. As if answering his prayers, a tiny spaceship later flies into their bedroom and observes the sleeping couple. It then flies around the house and notices one of the kitchen outlets. Afterward, the mechanical creature sends a signal, so another spaceship enters and uses the outlet to charge itself. When it's done, the creature meets with its companion and notices the torn photo from Frank's cafe. The commotion wakes Faye, and when she checks, she only finds the previously torn photo fixed. She then hears something in the kitchen and sees their toaster heading outside. Faye follows it to the pigeon shed on the rooftop, where she discovers the spaceship's hiding. The following day, Frank calls the retirement home, accepting that his wife needs help, but stops when he notices the fixed photo and frame. He asks his wife about this, but she's gone. Downstairs, Harry finds the jar that Carlos broke fixed, while Mason wakes to the garbage truck passing and realizes that they took the paintings he threw out yesterday. He rushes out the door, only to stop upon noticing that his door is fixed. Just then, Marisa approaches, confused since her mother Mary's statue is also fixed. Frank passes by them as he hurries up the stairs, so they follow him and find Faye tossing around bolts and nails, claiming to be feeding something. Thinking that she's confused, Frank asks his wife to head back. However, Marisa and Mason notice that their missing items are in the shed. This makes Frank think that his wife stole them, but Faye argues that the little guys did it. Mason then enters the shed for his items but gets electrocuted. With everyone panicked, Faye takes her husband's pocket watch, which she smashes to lure the spaceships to them. As Harry joins them, the spaceships appear and fix the watch, proving their existence. The group then goes to the cafe and finds that everything is repaired. The giddy Faye explains that the creatures like to fix things, so she calls them the Fixits. Convinced that this helps solve their problems, Frank dances with his wife in their restored cafe. Later, Harry watches the spaceships repair things around the building while Carlos discovers that the cafe is as good as new, confusing him. Upstairs, the group attempts to talk to one of the Fixits, but struggles to communicate with it. Faye then calls everyone for breakfast, but they're surprised to see the other Fixit charging itself in the kitchen. 
Frank tries to communicate with it again, but it panics and flies out. Afraid, Mason suggests calling the cops to investigate the creatures, but Carlos appears. He interrogates them about the cafe when a fix-it accidentally knocks his head with a pot. Seeing the pot floating, Carlos freezes. He then watches a can roll on its own, grab his metal bat, then rush upstairs. The thug chases after it and grabs his bat from the shed, but the fix-its electrocute the man. This causes the thug to run out screaming. That evening, Mason checks one of the fix-its, hoping to find a label to know where it came from. However, the spaceship sputters out a part of it to scare him off, though he notices that the piece is from his stolen coffee pot. The artist wonders why the fix-its came to their building, but Frank advises him not to question a miracle, otherwise it'd end. Meanwhile, Marisa keeps Faye company in their apartment. The elderly woman starts talking about her son, Bobby, which makes her sad since he and her husband didn't get along. They then hear commotion upstairs, so they join the rest, who watch the fix-its flying around playfully. Afterward, the two head into the shed, which lights up and shakes with energy. Faye concludes that the spaceships just made offsprings. The next day, Carlos watches the apartment building with suspicion. However, his thugs tease him about his story of the flying pot. During this, the tenants continue feeding the fixits anything metallic or electronic. As they do, Faye mistakes Mason for the father of Marisa's child, making things awkward for them. While heading downstairs, Mason asks about Marisa's pregnancy. She reveals that she hasn't seen a doctor yet, but assures the man that her boyfriend, Hector, will be back soon to take care of her. Hector is a musician, so Marisa defends that he travels a lot to work. After this, Marisa goes inside her home while making sure that her companion doesn't see that she collected the paintings he threw out. Later, the electricity in the apartment goes haywire, so the tenants hurry to watch the female fix it give birth, but it causes their building's fuse to blow up. The men hurry to fix it, allowing the fix to continue. Returning to the rooftop, they find that the fix it birthed two little creatures. Mason is ecstatic upon witnessing machines reproducing, while Frank promises to protect the creatures, thankful for their assistance. However, the female fix-it starts rattling and another offspring emerges, but it doesn't move. In the morning, Faye buries the poor creature, but Mason argues that this is their chance to look inside the machines. Hearing this horrifies Marisa, who tearfully points out that the little creature never had a chance. She then storms off, so Mason chases after her. Once the rest leave, Harry takes the still offspring. Downstairs, Mason catches up to the woman, but Marisa blurts out that she's worried about her child. However, their conversation is interrupted when Harry runs off with the dead fix-it and brings it to his apartment. Meanwhile, customers gather in the cafe, boosting the Riley's business. Among the customers are the construction workers who are supposed to tear down their building. Unbeknownst to them, the fix-its are helping out in the kitchen. With this, Faye shares that she has chosen names for the little ones. However, when her husband doesn't share her enthusiasm, she reminds him to be nice, otherwise they might leave. This makes her husband scowl, but seeing her happy, Frank doesn't argue. While the couple is busy, Kovacs and Carlos investigate the shed on the rooftop but find nothing. Because of this, Kovacs warns the thug that he has limited time to convince the tenants to leave. Changing tactics, Carlos goes to the cafe and attempts to make the place sound bad to the other customers. However, one of the construction workers dining there defends the place. Before things escalate, Faye gives the thug soup, still convinced that he's her son. Carla stresses that he's not Bobby and defends that he's trying to get them out so he can leave the city. Still confused, the woman invites him for dinner and the man smiles, liking how the woman makes him feel cared for. However, he notices one of the fixits in the kitchen and the scared man starts calling the elderly lady crazy, which the other patrons judge him for. During this, Harry struggles to repair the little one. After giving up, he accidentally breaks his table, causing the creature to fall into a sink and down the drain. Hearing it clinking inside, Harry follows it through the pipes and soon discovers it alive. Upstairs, Mason barges into Marisa's apartment, bringing her items to help with her pregnancy to ease her worries. However, he stops when he sees his paintings in her home. She defends that his paintings made her appreciate art, so Mason asks what she sees in them. Marisa comments that she thinks his self-portrait means that if he could move forward, he could escape the darkness and step into the sunlight. Touched by her interpretation, Mason stares at the woman softly. Meanwhile, Carlos meets Kovacs and his boss, Mr. Lacey. He tries to convince him that he can still get the tenants to leave, but the two aren't convinced. Lacey asserts that he plans to rebuild the entire block into a high-rise commercial area, so he gives Carlos three days to get rid of the tenants, even if it means diverting from legal options. That night, an inspired Mason paints Marisa, though he gets distracted when the little fix sits mess with his materials. Just as the two are getting close, however, Marisa's boyfriend returns. Excitedly, she goes to him. Later, the mother fix-it teaches her children how to fly. 
When the elderly couple checks, one of the little ones struggles to fly, and the one Harry brought to life catches it, surprising everyone that it's alive. Upstairs, a drunk Mason finds Marisa in his apartment, who reveals that Hector and his band have already left for Chicago. She defends that her boyfriend has a good job, but Mason points out that Hector keeps abandoning her. Marisa admits that she urged Hector to leave since Mason needs his muse. Hearing this, the artist kisses the woman, and the two finally accept their feelings for each other. While everyone is busy, Carlos breaks into the apartment's basement and destroys their pipelines and electricity. When the fix sits check on it, the thug goes to hide. The tenants soon head downstairs just as Carla slams an axe against the male spaceship. Afterward, he hurries to escape, but Mason catches up to him and steals his axe. Harry, who used to be a boxer, then puts on his gloves and approaches the thug. He lets Carla punch him before throwing him out. This, however, makes Faye panic as she still thinks the man is Bobby. With no choice, Frank reminds her that their son is dead. Refusing to believe this, Faye yells that her husband just wishes that Bobby was dead since all he did was make their son feel that he's not good enough. She blames him for driving Bobby away before storming off. While Faye remains in her apartment, the others search for the fix-it children who disappeared after the encounter with Carlos. They end up in the city when Harry chances upon a megaphone and runs off with it. Unbeknownst to them, a man named Dewitt stops by their apartment carrying gasoline cans. In Times Square, the others find Harry using the megaphone while using a dog whistle, as he used the whistle to call the fix-it he revived. This works, so the little fix-its head straight to him. Meanwhile, Faye finds that the mother Fixit has repaired its husband. She urges them to find their babies, so the two fly away. The two eventually reunite with their children, but the father becomes hostile to the tenants, thinking that they're at fault for what Carlos did. It convinces its family to leave the humans, so the Fixits fly away. At the apartment, Carlos discovers Dewitt setting up to burn the building down. The thug claims that the tenants have already left, but the man insists on completing the job. Pissed, Carlos breaks a gas pipe, asserting that he was assigned to this building, so he should be the one to burn it down. Dewitt argues that the crime has to look accidental, but the thug refuses to listen. Afraid of his actions, Dewitt leaves, but Carlos catches up to him. The arsonist reminds him that they should be escaping to avoid getting pinned for the crime, but the thug tells him to watch their work. Their argument is interrupted when Faye scolds them from her apartment. Horrified, Carlos insists on saving the lady, but Dewitt refuses to be killed in the fire. Carlos hurries to save Faye alone, but she refuses to go with him. Thinking quickly, the man pretends to be Bobby and lies that he wants to show her his new car and take her and Frank to see the game. Recalling how Bobby and Frank never got along, Faye finally realizes that Carlos isn't her son, so she locks herself in her bedroom to avoid him. There, she pulls out the newspaper clipping from her vanity table, which shows that Bobby was killed in a car crash. With no way of getting to her, Carlos goes downstairs in a desperate attempt to stop what Dewitt planted, but it blows up before he can get to it. As the place burns down, the thug rushes and breaks down Faye's door. Nearby, the tenants notice the fire trucks, so they rush to their homes and discover that it's burning. Thankfully, Carlos manages to climb down the fire escape with Faye over his shoulders. The woman is then rushed to the ambulance, and Frank accompanies her. Mason then spots Carlos, so the thug runs away. Before he can chase him, however, the building starts falling apart, much to everyone's horror. In the morning, the construction crew stops their work since Harry is still sitting on the apartment steps. Kovacs tells them to destroy the place, but the men remind him that they've already won, so they should at least let Harry mourn for his home. At night, Harry is still on the steps when the fix its return, bringing with them more of their kind to help out. The next day, Faye is dismissed from the hospital, so Frank tells her that they'll be going to the retirement home where Muriel and Sid are. However, the woman insists on going home. Carlos visits the woman with flowers, so Frank pretends that he's Bobby, hoping to cheer his wife up. However, this only brings Faye to tears, so Carlos leaves. Just then, an officer approaches them. A crowd gathers in amazement at their block, and the tenants soon arrive, surprised to find their building looking as good as new. Meanwhile, Lacey is swarmed by reporters, so he asserts that the reported fire was a mistake since he can't explain how the building was repaired overnight. As he gets into his car, Kovacs promises his boss that they'll continue driving the tenants out, but Lacey fires him. Finally, the tenants return to their restored home, which continues to stand between Lacey's high-rise buildings years later. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.